uh, as you have your handouts, you see that uh, it says who we really are or our identity in Christ. And when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, God becomes our Heavenly Father, and we have a new identification. And uh, this is found in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It'll be up on the board. 2 Corinthians 5.17. And we have to learn, sometimes we have the wrong identification about ourselves. Some folks don't have a very good attitude or a good picture of themselves, that they feel like they're nothing, or that they uh, will never amount to anything and that God doesn't love them, and they're just failures in this world. But look what God did. He says, therefore, on the board up there, if any person is engrafted in Christ, now when you read the Bible, remember, underline all of the in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. God put us in Christ, okay? And as he is, so are we, okay? And the Bible says, so as he is in the world, so are we. Now, remember, you accept everything by faith. Now, God says this. He, that person is a new creation, a new creature altogether. And the old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. Okay? Now, when a person accepts Jesus Christ, the outward man is the same, even though many times we have a little glow on our face because Christ has come in. But what part of us, if you're a Christian right now, is saved? We know it's our spirit man. Man is spirit, soul, and body, okay? The world don't even know that. But we're spirit beings. So what is new in us when you accept Christ? The spirit man. Now the outer man looks the same. I was hoping when I was born again I'd get a little hair on my head. But it didn't work out. But when I get my new glorified body, <laughs> boy, I'm going to have some hair on my head. Okay? So our new man is is recreated. Now, you've got to see that. Because when Adam sinned, he died spiritually first. And then he lost contact with God. Now, if you're a Christian, you should be able to fellowship with God every day. He's a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so it's our inner man. But how many of you know you had a lot of strongholds in your mind, a lot of carnal thinking that got in the way of you trying to walk with God. How many found that to be true? Yeah, yeah, okay. So the Bible has, says our mind has to be renewed, okay? And that's found in Romans 12. So put Romans 12 up there. Verse 1. And let's look at that. Now, Paul is talking to the Christian people. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, representing your members, presenting all your members and facilities as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, and consecrated, and well-pleasing to God which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Now, what people don't know is that God has chosen to live in us. Now, that's a powerful thought. I was 26 years old before I uh, became a Christian. I knew about God. I knew there was a God. But I found out the devils believe in God, but they're not saved. Because they don't have eternal life in them, who is Jesus Christ, okay? So my inner man and my heart 
I fell in love with Jesus Christ, my life changed. I mean, just radically changed. And I was amazed at it. Susan was amazed, my wife, because she lived with me for six years uh, as a, a non-believer. And when I got saved, I just felt different. I acted different. I thought different. I could touch God with my spirit. And that's where people don't understand. Now, I want to refresh your mind just a little bit. I know some of you, no, you're not that old, but maybe it slipped your mind. Can you remember now when you first fell in love, girls, with that man? Come on now, stare your mind. Huh? Some of you are not even moving out there. Are you out there? <laughs> Come on now. Well, I'm not going to beat you to death with condemnation. We, we're going to have a good time here. Do you remember when you first fell in love with that boy? I'm going to talk to the girls first since we have more girls here. Than boys. Do you remember? Did you start singing or what? Huh? You delighted yourself in him, and you woke up in the morning with that boy on your mind. Remember that? Yeah. Man, so this is love. <laughs> wow. I remember meeting Susan. Next day, I had a date with her. Next date, I had a date with her. The third day, I had a date with her. The fourth day, I had a date. Then I had to get on the train. I was in the Air Force, and I had to go to Amarillo, Texas. Ah, man, did I miss that girl. Man, it was just tugging at my heart. And it never left me. Never left me. And, when, and, and I would write, the first letter I wrote to Susan I was on a train, and she could write some good letters. I mean, I could eat them things. I mean, I just, I mean, you, when you're in the Air Force and you're away from home and somebody sends you a letter like that, my darling Bobby, oh, how I miss you so much. But I'm trying to get you in touch. Sometimes we need to come back and remember, but this is how... I can only speak for myself. I, I felt about God when I got saved. I woke up in the morning with Jesus on my mind. I went to bed at night with Jesus on my mind. All day long, I mean, I began to share him with people. Something happened great with, to, to Bob Tilton. And I go back to the, when I remember when I fell in love with Susan. And I wasn't even a Christian at that time. She worked at Western Union. And, and I, when I saw her, the Lord spoke to me and said, that's going to be your wife. Huh? I wasn't even looking for a wife. Who wants a wife? Plenty of girls out there. Yep, 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 you do. But let me tell you something. When you fall in love, it changes your life. Now, is that not true? Huh? Huh? Huh, 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 huh? Is that true? Missy, you remember that? Mrs. Keys, you remember that? Annie? Speak to me. Elizabeth? Hello? Look, look, she... Let me tell you something. Somebody that's, that never has fallen in, in love with another being, they don't know what we're talking about. Same way when we talk about Jesus, how much we love him, how much he's changed my life. He lives within me. He empowers me. He helps me to overcome a lot of things in my life. When I first became a Christian, I mean, I drank, I cursed, I smoked. 
and I threw rocks at people. Of course, y'all never did that. Huh? Oh, bricks, I'm sorry, you threw bricks at people. But when Jesus came into my life, there was a change. When Susan came into my life, there was a change. And as I think back now, I can see, it, you know, and that love for my wife, I delight in her. I just love to look at my wife, especially when she's fixing my breakfast. And I smell that ham and that eggs cooking. I just look at her, man. Wow. Hot cup of coffee. She comes over and puts it on my plate on, 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 on the table. Is there anything else you want, honey? Can I have a piece of toast? Coming up, takes my toast, give me the piece of toast. But you see, that's in the natural. And my life did change when I fell in love with my wife and she fell in love with me. I remember our first daughter was born. Wow. My love for my daughter was like, wow. I can't explain it. I can't put it up here and say, well, it's, you know, it's about like this. and It's just tall. But I, I would give my life for my daughter. Then later on, I wonder if we ever have another kid, which was five years later, I think it was. Could I love the other child as much as I love my first child? And guess what? I did. And then the question came to my mind, well, if we have another one, and we did. I told Susan to cut that foolishness out, but she wouldn't listen. <laughs> and I love that child. And I think about God, all of the children that he has. And I look at my three daughters, and I've got grandchildren, great-grandchildren running out of my hair now. Well, I mean, you know, what little bit of hair I have. And I love them all. I don't love one more than the other. And I say, God, that's the way you are. You don't love one of your children more than another. And those songs that we sing up there. And some people sit in congregations and they live and they think because maybe they're not as pretty as some movie star or good looking like Pastor Bob or something, God wouldn't love them. But he loves us unconditionally. What does that mean? Just like we are. He loves us. Just like you are. He loves you. And cannot love you any more than he loves you right now. Now that's the type of person I want to connect up with. I like to hang around people that treat me right, don't you? I like to hang around people that love me. I like a little hugging every once in a while. I don't care nothing about them stones. No way. Tonight, when you go from this place, you remember God loves you unconditionally, not because you're pretty and all of you are pretty and good looking. My granddaughter, I remember when she was about five years old, and I was over there, and I was had my head in her lap, and she was curling my hair, you know, messing with my hair. I mean, that was she could find, you know. She, <laughs> she, and I say, is Granddaddy good looking? And know what she said? You ain't good looking. I said, I'm not. No, no. She said, I said, is Granddaddy pretty? And she said, no, you're not pretty, granddaddy. I said, oh, I'm not. No, you good looking. I said, well, thank you, darling. I appreciate that. And Susan tells me that, too. You know, every day she encourages me. Honey, the older you get, the better you look. You're like good wine. You know what I mean? Susan is like good wine. The older she gets, the older I you know, Of course, we don't drink wine. But, I mean, they tell me that wine's like that the older it gets, you know. But to live in this world and not know love. So many people that I meet 
They don't really know what real love is. They want it. They long for it. And they do all these things to get people to try to love them. It lasts for a while. Then you quit doing it for them and they don't love you no more. But God's not that way. The Bible says God has power, but God is love. Now, I want to read, I want to read this here. You got your piece of paper. Now, we covered this before, but I want to hit this again. This is one elementary subject that most Christians still don't fully understand, and it is a powerful key to spiritual breakthrough. For countless believers around the globe today don't believe you're just, they don't believe you're just an old forgiven sinner. Now, when you become a Christian, you're not a sinner no more. You're a saint. That's all through the Bible. Okay? So, you're not a Now, you can sin. It's an act of the will after that. But you, you don't, you're not a sinner. You're classified as a saint, a child of God, a Christian. Now, just because some pastor tells you so, look these things up in the Word of God for yourself and know the truth. For Jesus said clearly that if we continue in His Word, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. We see John eight thirty two, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So just being a Christian is not just having your sins forgiven, but God has given us an inheritance, and that inheritance is kept for us in heaven. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Now that's a powerful thought. Everything that God has is ours. We are adopted into his family, and everything Father God has belongs to us. That shocks some people. But that's what the Word of God says. We are adopted into His family because by His grace we are saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, look at down, at the <clears throat> down there. The opposite is true of deception or false belief. A lot of people have false belief. They think God's up there with a big baseball bat ready to hit them in the head if you do wrong. No, that's not love. That's not God. Now, His Spirit lives within us. And I thank God if I do something wrong, He'll let me know. Or have you found that to be true? That's why we're not under the law anymore. We don't need the law no more. We have the lawgiver living in us. And if Christ is in you, He is our only hope of glory. And that's the mystery that the Bible talks about. Christ in us, okay? Let's finish reading this. And will cause you to live in bondage unnecessarily. This subject, subject is no exception. If you see yourself as a failure, you will not be able to boldly exercise your authority in Christ. See, God has given us authority. I remember the first time I cast out a demon out of a person. That authority that God had given to me in the name of Jesus. I said to that spirit, you come out. In fact, this spirit was a, uh, and I'm trying to think the type of spirit that was. That was a perfectionist spirit, okay? And I said, you perfection spirit, come out of this man now in Jesus' name. He looked at me. He says, can we talk this over? I said, no, get out now in Jesus' name. That demon left. Well, one quarter of Jesus' ministry, one quarter of his ministry was casting out demons. And many of the church people have forgot about that. But we have that authority to cast down demons. Now, because you will feel unworthy even after the blood of Christ has made you worthy, if you claim to be unworthy after the blood of Christ has made you worthy, then you are denying the work of Christ in your life. That's a powerful thought. I remember when I, that truth came to me, I repented. I said, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for not accepting what you've done for me. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to shock you, knock your hat off.
You ready? All right, if you're a Christian right now, and a lot of people don't understand this, you are righteous. You agree to that? That's what the Bible says. You agree to that? Yeah, you are righteous because the Bible says in that same scripture that uh, we read, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, 18, 19, 21, he that knew no sin became sin with our sins, and we became righteous with his righteousness. So therefore, we have right standing with God. Now, let's move on a little bit further here, real quick. I want you to say to yourself, I am worthy because Jesus' blood has made me worthy. Do it. I dare you. Okay. Now, if you think you're unworthy, you're going to walk around with your head all bent down. No, you are a child of God. God has redeemed you and brought you into his family. The Bible says he has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and placed us into the kingdom of the Son of God. We are now in the kingdom of God. You are loved by God the Father. You are loved by God not because of what you've done. Now, it makes us all feel good when we do good. How many likes when you cut your grass, you feel real good? How many feels good when you don't cut your grass? <laughs> it makes you feel, when you clean the house all up. Remember you girls, in the, you clean the house all up. It makes you feel good, doesn't it? But you're not saved by that. You're saved by the grace of God, unmerited favor. But it sure makes you feel good when all the dishes are washed. Every time I think about the dishes being washed, I think of my girls getting all those, uh, remember all those uh, warts on their hands? One had 16, one had 19. In one way, they were happy that they had those warts because Susan wouldn't let them do wash the dishes. I said, maybe I need to get a few warts on my hands. Yeah. Well, what I did, I went out, worked on the car, and got all this grease on my hand, so that canceled me out. The girls had warts and canceled them out, so Susan did the dishes. But you remember, we got into confessing the Word of God, and two and a half months, after two and a half months, Every wart left her hands. Because the Bible says there's medicine in the Word of God. God's Word is medicine even to our flesh. You know, sometimes people say, say things one time and they say, well, that, that'll do it forever. Uh, let's see. Uh, girls, when's the last time you told your husband you loved him? Well, let's see. Back in 18, what, 24, uh, I, to, I tell Susan every day I love her. See, you gotta react. You know, just how many? How many? When you, do you laugh a lot with your mate? Susan and me will laugh all the time. We laugh. What do you laugh at about? Nothing. It's just it's funny. No, you know, Lois is staying at our house. There's a lot of laughter in our house. Then even she's beginning to like it. Anyway, you are loved. Now, that's important for you to grasp that and let that be burned into the fiber of your being because love has power. Paul said it this way, it's the love of Christ that motivates me, that moves me to do what I do for the glory of God. Anybody know what complacency is? After I eat a full meal, I get complacent. How about you? <laughs> My eyes seem to want to shut, you know. But the love of God moves you to do something for God and for people. All right, you are loved by God, not because of what you've done, but because of, what, because of who you are. And who are you if you're a Christian? You're a child of God Almighty. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He longed to have a relationship with you even before you became his child. Now, we always look at salvation from our viewpoint. Now, I want you to look at me. Everybody look at me. God's viewpoint. Here's God. 
We say, oh, God, I want to have, I want to have a relationship with you. Here's what God is saying, but I want a relationship with you. We never think of that, do we? Will you, will you come up here for a moment? Suppose Willie wants a relationship with me. Uh, see, but you see, I want a relationship with him. Mama Mia! <laughs> oh, now you can't tell me that ain't good. Huh? See, God wants a relationship with us, so quit running from God and run! <laughs> Okay, and I know you will. Tell people that. Some people think God's after them. Well, he is after them because he wants our relationship with them. He wants us to hear, Abba Father. I remember I used to come home from work and my kids would run to me just like Willie me, boy. You remember that? Your kids just come to you? Those little kids back there, man, they just, don't they grab your heart? Grab your pocketbook, too, when they get older. <laughs> but there's that love. You shout it out. All right. All right, let's move on real quick. I want to let you go at, at least by midnight. Now, listen to this. Romans 5 eight, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were yet sinners, separated from God because of Adam's sin, it came down through the DNA to us, that's when he died for us. That's what I tell people. I mean, you just don't do things for people that do good for you, to you. The real test is, in, of our Christian faith, is we do to some people that are mean to us. And they can't pay us back. And they are still in their sins. Because that's when Christ died for us. Everybody understand that? Raise your hand. That's important. All right. This one, this one may be hard to get your mind around, but it is true. God loves us with the same love that he had towards Jesus himself. Look at this passage of Scripture. This is found in John 17, 23. Let's put that on the board. Boy, I remember when I discovered this. I said, wow, wow, he loves me just as he much as he loves Jesus Christ. Now look, Jesus is talking. He says, I in them, Christ in us. See, that's the mystery. In the Old Testament, they didn't know that. God was external. God was in, in the Holy of Holies. But the mystery of the New Testament is God now lives in his creation, his, in man. And that is so exciting to, to build that relationship with God, even though I can't see him. We talk, we fellowship, he talks to me, I talk to him. You say, how can that be? I know some of you know that, some of you might not know that, but that's available to you as you grow in the Lord. All right, look at what it says. This one, uh, okay, here we go. I in them and you in me, in order that they may become one and perfectly united, that the world may know and definitely recognize that you sent me and that you have loved them. Who is them? That's us, the disciples, Christians. Them, even as you have loved me. Case closed. I've heard people say, well, nobody loves me. Beg your pardon. God loves you. No greater love that a man can have than for a man to lay down his life for a friend. That's what, that's what Jesus Christ. Man, I tell you, he's the best friend, the best Savior. Man, I love him so much. And pe people say, well, who are you talking to, Bob? Oh, I'm talking to the Lord. Well, where's he at? Right here, he lives in me. What? That's a mystery. That's in the Bible. Read that Sunday. All right, let's go on. Everybody say, God loves me as much as he does Jesus Christ. 
Woo! Man, grab that real quick, like. Mm -mm. That's better than Mama's banana pudding. I ain't kicking that banana pudding, though. All right. Willie, there's some food back there, I think, for Remember, don't forget that. No ice cream, though. I told you, no ice cream. Jesus said that the greatest love a man can show for his friends, I just, I just quoted that, is when he lays down his life for them. Jesus laid down his life for us. That is how valuable and dear we are to him. Whew. Now, let's, let's check our own selves. Is there anybody in here that would lay their life down for me? One, Willie. Nobody up there. One back there. Okay. I would lay my life down gladly for any one of you. What kind of shepherd would I be if I would not lay my life? See, we've got to grab this love and realize, all right, since you won't lay down your life for me, how many in here would lay their life down for their husband? <laughs> One person back there, Missy. Hear that, Rick? <laughs> I want to say that again. How many women in here would lay their life down for their husband? One. I'm proud of you, Missy. We'll pray for these other girls. I know you girls do. Every day, every day you're laying your life down for your husbands. All right, now watch, now watch this. How many would lay their life down for their children? Every hand goes up. Susan would lay her life down for me just like that. I'd lay my life down for her just, just like that. Because you see, I can't die. Y'all don't understand? Yeah, I know most of you understand what I'm talking about. Jesus said, he that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. He that believeth in me shall never die. Did you know that? You knew that? Did you know that? Good. Oh, goodness, this old outer shell. I mean, you know, how many, I want to ask you a question. How many eat uh, pecans? How many eat the outer shell? What do you do? You break that outer shell, you get the spirit out, you eat the spirit and throw the body away. Right? Right. Well, God's got a better plan. He's got a plan for these bodies. One day, they're like a seed. They'll be resurrected. Our spirit man will come back into that resurrected body, and we will have a body just like Jesus. And you can get rid of all your keys. You don't need no keys, Mrs. Keys. You don't need no keys. Keys will be gone because you can walk right through the wall. Is that true? Is that scripture? If you know your Bible, shake your head. Yeah, okay. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. As a matter of fact, if we don't realize the love of God, we cannot be filled with the fullness of God. Oh, my goodness. Did we catch that? Someone said, oh, I want to be filled with the love of God. Wow, look what it says. If we don't realize the love of God that he has for us personally, we cannot be filled with the fullness of God. We will lack his fullness in our lives until we come to know of his deep love for us. I'm going to ask everybody a question. The Bible goes like this. Why do you love God? Because he first loved us. See, some people will never know love until we as Christians love them first. Then they, oh, that's love? Kindness, that's love. You're not 
judging me by my outward appearance? Where did you get this love from God? God has shed his love in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. There's no effort in me to give my life for my wife. None whatsoever. That's just how the love of God works. There's no strain for me to serve God. That's just how the love of God works. It's a sheer pleasure to serve God and to walk with God. Not just serve God, but to walk with my Father, to walk with God, to talk with God, to feel His power in my life that motivates me to be what I need to be for His glory. See, it's not within man to love. Oh, yeah, you love me, you know. I'll love you to the degree that you love me. But you stop loving me, cut you off. That's man, but not God. But not a true Christian. A true Christian loves unconditionally. Oh, sometimes you feel like sending them to the moon. I see Elizabeth by there smiling. <laughs> How many, come on, let's be honest, come on. How many, sometimes you feel like sitting your husband to the moon. Look at the hands go up. Whoa, glory. Well, welcome to the crowd. But you don't because the love of God constrains you, constrains you. And besides that, the policeman lives next door. Yeah, we all have these feelings. That's part of the old creation. But God has taught us, put that off. Put your gun away. Just use the frying pan to cook the eggs and the bacon. I do like that little sound, though, don't you? You know, you know when you hit your husband in the head, you go, or does it sound more like uh, holler, right? Holler. That, that sounds holler, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I see some of y'all laughing right there. Have you noticed how my head is sort of warped? <laughs> Let's get to preaching, Bob. Okay. There's a scripture there in, uh, let's read that. No one has greater love, no one has shown stronger affection than to lay down or give up his own life for his friends. Now, I want you to turn, if you will, to Romans chapter uh, 2, verse 4. Boy, this is a powerful scripture, and it has really connected me with love. Now, look what Paul is saying here. Or are you so blind as to trifle with the and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness, talking about God's kindness and forbearance and long-suffering and patience. Now, God's got all of that. Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact? What is the fact? That God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent to change your mind and inner man to accept God's will. Does that ring any bells? My wife has been so good to me, and I've said this before, and I'll say it until Jesus takes me home. It's brought me to repentance. How many understands that? Just a little When somebody is so good to you all the time, and you're mean to them, you give them a piece of your mind 24-7. That's why some folks ain't got much mind left. They just give it all away. Anybody ever done that? Some of you ain't talking. So,
so good to me. I can't help from loving him and serving him. My wife is so good to me. It makes me want, listen to this, it makes me want to be good to her. As a pastor, have counseled so many married couples. He did this, she did that. Ain't I right, pastor? He says, ain't I right? I say, you're both wrong. What? I ain't coming to this church anymore. I love you. But let me tell you what the problem is. You're leaving out the equator. Love. I said, turn to love. Turn to, uh, put that on the board. 1 Corinthians 13. Amplified. All right, here we go. Are we ready? If I can speak in the tongue of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional spiritual devotion, such as is inspired by God's love for and in us, I am only a noisy tongue or a Clinging symbol. Bing, bing. Next. Let's move right on down the line now. And if you have, and if I have prophetic powers and gifts of interpreting the divine will and purpose and understand all the secret truths and mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless nobody. Woo! Anybody want to repent? Good time to repent. The altar's open. Even if I dote out all that I have to the poor, in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burnt, or in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, nothing, gain, I gain nothing. Next. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious, nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, and does not display itself Heartedly. Next. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmanly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us does not insist on its own rights or its own way. Anybody want to repent? The altar's open. It, 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 repentant ain't a bad word, you know, because you can get a lot off your shoulder. For it is not self-seeking, it is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Oh, my goodness. You think we ought to stop there? Let's move on a little bit further. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevails. Next. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are faithless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, never fades out, or become. I don't know if I can read this anymore. This is the heavy stuff, isn't it? Somebody want to read it for me? Wow. Becomes obsolete or comes to an end. As, you, as for prophesying the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. 
it will lose its value and be superseded by truth. That's enough. I, I can't read no more. The altar is now open. <laughs> How many have got some of those characteristics? Sure you do. Sure you do. How many see areas that maybe they might fail? Does God condemn us? No. God don't condemn us. Has anybody failed in any of that? Has anybody ever kept all of that? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, it's simple. It's not complicated. If you see that you fail in one area, God, the Holy Spirit, has been given to us to help us to overcome those tendencies to far back. How many is quick on the draw? How many know that? <whistles> Got you. How many is quick? Raise your hand on the, on the Somebody say something. You're real quick. <whistles> huh? You're far back. Ain't nobody in here quick on the draw. Willie? Yeah, all right. Willie? Oh. Okay. Well, listen. You just have to say, God, help me in that area. Because I, I've had to learn, and I, I used to be quick on the draw. I, I used to shoot them first and ask questions later. You get into a lot of trouble that way. How many remembers the scripture that says that God will give us more and more grace to overcome these tendencies? How remembers where that, okay, where is that at? You remember? Hmm? I forgot myself. <laughs> and I was firing that one off left and right. You remember? Oh, hallelujah. That's James 4.16. How can I forget that? I drill Susan every morning with that one. Look what it says. But he gives us more and more. Who's us? If, 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 if you, is you, is, is that include you? Say us. That's me. Us. Preacher too. Grace, power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency. All right. Put your gun up. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Remember that. Meet this evil tendency and all others fully, all other evil tendencies. That is why he says God sets himself against the proud and haughty, but gives grace continuously to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. So if you've got these things in your life and you're far back, you shoot before you think, and then you've hurt the person's feelings, they go off wounded, it takes them all day to get it, get it out of their system, say, God, give me grace and mercy. I come to the throne of God. Lord, you said you'd give me more and more grace to overcome this tendency. Now, but if you're too proudful, you can't receive it. But if you're humble enough, you can receive that grace, and that's God's ability to help you to overcome that problem. Okay? Very simple, not complicated. And this is how you get connected up with God, and you begin to see God work in your life. And you say, you know, God is really real. Man. I mean, he helped me to quit smoking, quit drinking. He called, he, I mean, you name it, he, he's helped me to, all of those things. I used to have anger. I can't believe the time is going by already. It goes by fast when you're having fun. <laughs> but I got to close. But I used to have anger. How many ever had anger? Yeah. That's that's bad, anger. Because, I mean, you lose all your friends after a while, you know. But thank God I don't have that anger no more. Because of God's grace and mercy. He has given me grace upon grace to overcome that tendency to get angry. Wife comes up to me, used to be, well, honey, I, you know, I spent this amount of money, you know, on the kids' clothes. How much? Well, it was only $450. $450! 
She had unblown her wig off. And she's like, but see, she's, she forgives me, and I've repented. And now I say, sugar, sugar, darling, cupcake. How much did you spend? A thousand? Is that all? See, I've learned. You can, I haven't missed any meals. I got two cars. I got a beautiful wife, a beautiful congregation. I got food in my refrigerator. I got eternal life. I got an inheritance in heaven that my wife can't get a hold of. <laughs> First Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And you do too. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your grace, your mercy. Lord, I thank you.